You're listening to Experience Imagination, a themed entertainment design podcast presented by Falcons Creative Group. Every episode, we discuss a new topic with a panel of creative professionals. Hi, I'm Cecil McPurry, President and Chief Creative Officer of Falcons. Hi, everyone. Welcome back to Experience Imagination. Your ears do not deceive you. You are not hearing Abhinav Narayan imitate someone else. He is taking a much-deserved vacation, so I'm filling in for him. I'm Audrey DeLong, and I work at Falcons as a producer and writer. If you listened to our August episode, you heard me interviewing Abhinav about bringing characters to life on paper through the storytelling and script writing process. We also spoke to a couple of our artists here about drawing characters, and we had a fascinating conversation with Corey Demereaux, Associate Creative Director at Katmandu Group. On this episode, we'll continue exploring the various ways that characters are brought to life. One of those ways is by voicing the character, and we have two of the very best VO artists joining us now. What is Beethoven's favorite fruit? Banana! Banana! <laughs> School is cruel. We tried, but he wasn't even participating in the project. What a loser. Yes, hello. Principal Brown from Elmore Junior High. I would like to order some flowers, uh, roses, and the card should read To Miss Simeon. Love from your big bundle of brow. That was Grant and Jessica G. George voicing characters for us a few years ago. The dynamic duo, as they're called, are married, and they often work together. Welcome, you two. Thank you. Thank you very much. (laughs) Appreciate being here. (laughs) Just kidding. (laughs) Who who she is talking to? I don't know, dear. (laughs) 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 <laughs> okay. That's just insanity. That's why we work in a padded booth. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I can only imagine. We worked with you two on IMG Worlds of Adventure, one of our theme park yes. projects in Dubai. Um, tell us about those characters that you performed. Well, we had a lot of voice matching that we had to do. And I think uh, at the time you gave us about 12 characters yes. from each show. Right. Um, Gumball and Adventure right. Time. Um, That's right. Which was, it's really interesting because the characters were so different in their ages and their diversity. So we had our, we had our hands full to do a lot of matching and stretching. Yeah, I think what the challenge was originally for us was that they were real characters. The characters in a lot of those aren't character or cartoony. So we right. were trying to emulate real live 10-year-old, 12-year-old boys. <laughs> And um, so we had our hands full. We were trying to nail it. But I think when an adult does a kid's voice, Mm -hmm. you still kind of hear that it's an adult most of the time. (laughs) Right. Jessica, you have voiced uh, male characters? Oh, yeah. Lots and lots of them. So one of my favorite shows of all time, probably my favorite show of all time, is The Simpsons. So I have... uh, this great appreciation for people who can stretch their voices the way you two do. And of course, the voice of Bart Simpson is a female. <laughs> An Nancy Cartwright. Right, now. right exactly. And so then the other voice that should have been done when they went on strike was me. <laughs> <laughs> How does someone who is the opposite gender actually get into the voice of a young 10-year-old boy? Women have a tendency to do the boys better because boys are higher. So, um, and guys have a harder time, you know, starting from there. Bring it back to here. Uh-huh. Women can, women have a, a, a shorter range. So it's about knowing where the placement is. For me, a lot of times being able to get the impetus for going into character is really being able to see a picture of the character. And then I take on the look. Mm-hmm. And, you know, if, if he's got a squint, squinty eyes and, you know, pursed lips, and then I just start working it. I uh, just start working it. Maybe he's got to get a little older or be more like a surfer dude or whatever, you know. <laughs> mm-hmm. But it, it, it's, it really starts with the way they look. And if I'm not given that picture, mm-hmm. I have to work off the specs. Oh, so a description of the character. Yeah. Yeah, it always helps to have the character because I think it's body before voice Mm -hmm. in in getting into character. Like you take the stance before you create the voice. You have to really take the – what they look like is so incredibly important and to put somebody into character. You never see people in an ensemble. People who are working are 
always in their character stance. They're all they always have it. They're always holding on to it. You never see somebody just sitting there. Interesting. That leads me into another question I have for you guys is uh, sometimes when I watch behind the scenes, they give you a little bit of a a take on a voice actor in the booth and it looks like they're really working up a sweat. And I can imagine how physical that could be. Can you kind of walk the audience through how that works? It is definitely physical. And that's, that's how we start. We kind of take a look at the picture, assume the position as we call it, which is looking at their posture. And some are very big and strong. Other characters are kind of slumped and, you know, we we take that all into account. How is their facial structure, like their orthodonture, (laughs) is very important. Um, In terms of how much work goes into it, yeah, it gets very physical, uh, especially when we're doing video games or we're doing these superhero things where there's a lot of activity and a lot of efforts, as we call them. So you're running, you're constantly in motion. When we're working on, uh, like, the Avengers... Um, and they're always in battle. We have to know what the scene is and what the action is because that has to be infused into the, the voice. You know, you can't just say, I'm going to go over here and take this. Uh, you you got to put the energy into it. Like, I'm going to go over here and take this. And for, and and he's moving his arms and his legs and, you know, his head not not off access. But, but um, if you're not sweating, you're not working. That's right. You can't sit down and fight crime. So anytime we have (laughs) any kind of adventure series that we're working on or it's a video game, we're always standing up and we come out drenched. Mm. Yeah, I'm surprised when people sit down in ensemble. Mm -hmm. I, 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 I always stand. I always stand. And I did read that you two still take part in improv classes. Is that true? Oh, yeah. Yeah, we never stop studying our craft Even though most of the writers will write things that fit right into a 30-second spot and there's not much room for anything else, we know that what we bring to these characters, if we're doing it for an animated project, what we bring to our partner reads is always a sense of improv, like going off Mm -hmm. the page and, and creating the realism. And that's what's booked us a lot of jobs. Being bold enough to, you know, add your own little flavor in there without, you know, while still honoring the writer's words. There's always, give us three takes, and I'll always Mm -hmm. give it as scripted, I'll give it as a little variation, and then I'll add my own little flavor to it while still maintaining the story that needs to be told. But that ends up being the one that really gets used because you're infusing it with, like, the life of the character. By bringing them improvisation and knowing who you are as the character, you're adding something to it that is just jumps right off the page and but still maintains what needs to be told through the story. You're bringing them to life in your own way. Yeah, absolutely. If it says, you know, Candy is happy about this new apple that she's getting, right? You're not going to go like, I'm happy about this new apple that I'm getting. It's going to be like, oh, oh, I'm so happy about this new apple that I have. You know, that kind of thing okay. where you're really throwing in something. Bring it to life. Bring it to life. And I think people are really not taught that and they're not so they're, – they're scared to do it because they want to give the client exactly what the client wants. And as much as I respect and appreciate that because you've got to get learn to get into the heads of people, you still have to do you 100%. So uh, I'm in this position uh, at Falcons is is one of my jobs is to cast uh, voiceover talent. So I'll send scripts out and it's sort of like a blind audition because it's not, uh, I don't get the chance to direct the first pass anyway. So we get these auditioners that are just reading off the page and it's a little hard. Sometimes I try to communicate in the email or to the agent, like it should be read like this, but then you do get those few auditions where they add their own flavor to it. So is that something you do on a regular basis when you do have to audition for a role? Yeah, and it's also what we hear in casting, which is really interesting. You can send out a character and have specs and a picture to Mm -hmm. 20 people, and you're going to get 20 completely different things back. And some that the creators might not have even considered. Right. So, but that's always something that we try to do. You know, I call it taking sort of a creative turn. Like, I look at the script, I kind of get an idea of what they're looking for In general, how does this character correspond to the story? But then I I also think to myself, what is everybody going to do? How can I start my audition off with something that nobody else is going to come up with? That's definitely 
a piece of me? How am I going to put myself into this character so that it stands out different from the pack? Because when you hear the same lines, you know, starting from the same place in a script for 50 different roles, it kind of gets just treacherous. And when somebody does something different out of the blue, you're like, whoa, that it grabs your attention and you pay attention. Yeah, you have to find that way to stand out for sure. So um, just turning the conversation to themed entertainment specifically, what excites you most about themed entertainment? It always excites us to hear ourselves. Are you kidding? Yes, we waited <laughs> in line at the... Narcy uh, narcissists. At the um, submarine ride at Disneyland and could hear Jessica as one of the seagulls there from Finding Nemo. Mine, 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 so, mine. You it's, know, or... it's totally fun. Our kids are so unamused by us now. <laughs> like, we'd be like, that's mommy. And they'd be like, okay, yeah. yeah. But so, the best thing is when we're on the Simpsons ride at Universal and Jessica's doing Marge Simpson from the back seat of the of the simulator. So people are kind of looking around like, what? What's going on? <laughs> no. How, yeah. How's she in the car with us? Yeah. And I'll keep talking and I'll hear somebody like, hey, Kathy. Right? <laughs> that must be a fun you. thing to play with. <laughs> yeah. So, oh, yeah. yeah. So just but I I got to tell you, it's one of my favorite things to do. I, I want to do more of it. Um, am I selling myself? So <laughs> I, I, I do. I love being there's there's stable being in rides. You get to hear it all the time for so long. I could go to was it Disney Disneyland and hear myself on on the gold rush. You know, keep your arms, hands, legs inside the ride at all times, you know, that kind of thing. Right. And 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 it was so fun to be able to do that. And I know they eventually change over and as technology gets better and better. Mm -hmm. It really is a thrill to be part of that magic where, because when you're in a theme park, you're, as long as it's not hot and you're waiting in lines, but your whole adrenaline is heightened and everybody's having a good time. And it's just part of the fond memories is those certain voices that you'll remember for the rest of your life. It, it's just, it's a part of your childhood. And so to be a part of that and it's a thrill. It was a pleasure speaking with Grant and Jessica G. George, the dynamic duo, the talented married couple voiceover professionals. Thank you so much for joining us on Experience Imagination. Thank you Thanks for having you. us. That was fun. Now we want to jump into our conversation with Eric Calderon. And by the way, Falcons has just officially announced that Eric is teaming up with us to adapt Katmandu Group's theme park IP into an animated series. He is credited with developing more than a dozen animated TV series, including Afro Samurai, starring Samuel L. Jackson. He recently wrote and executive produced an animated series based on Aliens vs. Predator, and he was previously the showrunner for an animated series based on Hasbro's Transformers, called Transformers The Combiner Wars. His last gig was SVP at Octopi, where he teamed up with the Russo brothers of Avengers fame. While at Octopi, Eric helped set up the Netflix deal for the animated series Magic the Gathering, which is based on the classic card game. Welcome, Eric. Uh, hi. Well, uh, thanks for having me, first of all, and um, I'm pretty excited about this opportunity. So speaking of your development background, very lengthy background, though, that you have, I'm sure you can tell us a lot about what happens during the development process that a lot of people probably are not aware of. That's correct. Actually, you know, even recently, about two years ago, I started a, um, a YouTube channel called Surviving Animation that actually educates people about the basics of the business of cartoons, because there is a lot to talk about in terms of how development works, but there's just not a lot of places to learn that. And most of the kind of information and wisdom that gets shared about development, you know, comes from word of mouth. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a topic we can deep dive in many directions, but I thought to try to put it all in one place, you know, I, I started this educational YouTube platform and uh, it's been pretty fun. So I got about a little over 6,000 subscribers, you know, it's not a huge amount, but it's very focused. So I have kind of a active community of people talking about development for cartoons. What have you seen in the storytelling process, specifically with characters over the years? How have they evolved? What types of characters are stories being told for now? Well, what's interesting, I think, about character development and animation is, you know, first and foremost, people who work in the animation industry understand that, especially when it comes to the TV level. For a while, there was a certain what I'd call flattening of character development because the tools that we have to uh, act in animation are a little bit more limited than the palette of, let's say, a live action director 
a live action actor and cinematographer. So, you know, what we can accomplish has to be a lot more pre-planned, uh, a lot more kind of architecturally set up. So there was a while where we thought, oh, animated characters only possible of, of a more limited range of, of acting, you know, but now I think, you know, I think especially the past five, six years, it's, a, it's really in my career, one of the biggest renaissances of the animation uh, medium itself. So now we're seeing character development that's much more on par with our live action brethren. So, you know, you look at a show like BoJack Horseman mm -hmm. and that is really, it's a nuanced, very complicated character that, you know, is, is as good as Californication. For sure. And I'm wondering too, how social media has influenced both the telling of stories and characters that are written for animation. That's a really good question. I mean, I, I one of the big things I, I will say, I, I think this might be related to what you're talking about, but it could be tangential. So um, please kick me back if I go off the deep end here. But one thing social media has really done, you know, in the fact that we're all super connected all the time is, you know, the foundational idea of the heroic journey as told by Joseph Campbell as really being challenged because, you know, we are no longer in a world where you're in a separated agrarian society and a hero can go out to somewhere and find this forbidden knowledge and bring it back to your village, your town and say, look what I have brought back for you. Because we all know the same information all the time. So now we're in a collective journey. And if we're in a collective journey and movements happen overnight and society changes you know, week to week, you know, who it's very tough for a singular character to be the, you know, quote unquote hero. I see. It takes a, it takes a family of characters. It takes a large cast to affect systematic change. So that changes storytelling, that changes character, that, that changes everything. But to your point, it's from social media. I love that. There's a guy in, in New York. It's, he's an idol of mine named Jeff Gomez. And he's not only the guy who first coined the term transmedia, hmm. but he also is one of the big challengers of the heroic journey and saying it's a collective journey. For sure. People want to feel like they're part of a movement. Getting back to how writers flesh out their stories. Yeah. What is the one key thing, or maybe there's two or three key things that you find yourself talking to writers about, especially when it comes to like writing the main character? I like to talk you know, talking about a single character is sometimes like dealing with a symptom. And, you know, whenever I talk with people, the first thing I do kind of like I mentioned is I talk about the genre. Let's take an example. If someone's like, hey, what do you think of this character in my preschool show? I'll go, well, there are a lot of genres of preschool. <laughs> so if you're doing real preschool, which is like kind of two to four, three to five, let's say you're doing STEM education. Let's say your show's about math your character, quote unquote, isn't as important as are you landing the curriculum? Mm -hmm. You know, so if your show is about math, I don't care so much who your character is. I care that at the end of that seven minutes or 11 minutes or 22 minutes that a educator has approved that you're teaching math at the cognitive level of a two to four year old. You know, again, it's like, how do you talk about character development mm -hmm. in a two to five preschool curriculum driven show? But, but you still realize that the audience is is going to be attracted to that character. They want the character to appeal to them. Right. And so you have to write that character in an appealing way, I would imagine. That's correct. That's correct. But, you know, what, what I'm fascinated with, and if, if we can stay on preschool for a second, memory, long-term memory doesn't really kick in until about five or six. Mm. And so writers who work on preschool are really writing a realm that they have no cognitive memory of, that no one does, no human does. <laughs> so how do we relate to a character that is meant for two to five-year-olds? We don't really know. We're kind of guessing. Yeah, I mean, uh, unfortunately, there's not a lot of articulate two-year-olds out there who have the vocabulary <laughs> to explain exactly what they're looking for and what they like. One day, maybe. <laughs> It'll be wired in at birth. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so uh, we talk about bringing characters to life with voice actors. You've mm. worked in the animation process for 26 years now. Tell us about some of the other parts of the process. Development of characters, I think, for animation is interesting because it can come from a bunch of sources. You know, like um, Rugrats 
was famously created by a napkin sketch at Mipcom. Uh huh. And the idea of Rugrats, which was created by, you know, Gabor Chupo, who was, you know, the other half of Klasky Chupo, is that, you know, he kind of just pitched this idea in Nickelodeon, which is like, what about a show from a baby's point of view? You know, so everything is looking up, everything is scaled bigger. And he kind of just made a little, you know, yeah, this kind of those Rugrats kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, the organic nature of an idea like that is so fun to me because that's what animation can do really well. Oh, for sure. Yeah, I can create that world. That's right. One of the early shows I worked on was a show called Eon Flux, which was a real cerebral action adventure cartoon uh, in the early 90s. It was developed in shorts first and the character died at the end of every episode. Mm. And when you talk to Peter Chung, who's the creator of Eon Flux, he said he created Eon Flux as a reaction from having to work on G.I. Joe in the 80s. And he's like, every time I had to animate G.I. Joe, they always told me, remember, nobody can die. Nobody can really get hurt. <laughs> so like G.I. Joe would like shoot laser machine guns at helicopters. All the bad guys would like parachute out at the end. Oh. And they would like wave their fists at the camera and say like, we'll get you G.I. Joe because they can't die. I see. <laughs> and so, you know, it's funny how his character development came as a reaction to his frustration from the ties that were bound to him on kids cartoons mm -hmm. yeah frustration that no one can die <laughs> yeah that's right yeah exactly so i'm gonna kill my character at the end of every episode <laughs> <laughs> that is total rebellion <laughs> yeah, that's right so when you read pilot scripts i'm sure you read a lot of pilot yeah, scripts i do i do what are what would you say the common issues are that you see with pilot scripts well, you know, I think the pilot script that is probably the most frustrating to read for me is usually the the epic sci-fi serial episodic, you know, and I think the, one of the reasons is, you know, I, I kind of say I like to divide writers into two pockets, and I could be wrong about this to already stereotype them, but I feel like there's the kind of the world builders who are the people who are like in a planet with this society and this technology and look at all these countries and, you know, they really want to create this incredible map of all these big global societal political ideas, right? Those are the world builders, right? The other people are the ones who, who write the human condition, you know, which is like four characters in an apartment. They really understand people and humanity, mm -hmm. you know? And when you find that magic combination of a person who can do both, you get this great pilot, right? But oftentimes I usually get the prior, which is, Here's the text scrawl of everything you need to know about my world. Right. I like to tell people, listen, here's what we really need to do. It doesn't matter how big your world is or how cool your world is or how great it is. You need to show the world from the point of view of what your main character can see. Mm -hmm. Right? So once you set that up, you need to do two other things very carefully. One, set up what I call the tenuous homeostasis of their worldview and their environment. If I'm like a 1900s fireman and I am from uh, five generations of fi firemen people, but I'm the first guy who doesn't want to be a fireman, I'm in a tenuous homeostasis, right? Which is I'm doing the job. It's not that great, but you know, so the audience needs to feel it's tenuous, not comfortable. Right. Right. Now at the end of that pilot, you need to move from tenuous homeostasis to their world is broken. Something has changed and they can never, ever go back to even the tenuous homeostasis. And at the end of the pilot, you've got to go, I'm really in trouble. Something's really going wrong. And oh my gosh, I got to watch the next episode. Mm -hmm. I'm sure I'm speaking for a lot of people, but one of the things that I have to feel attached to in a movie or a television series, and there's so much content out there right now is you can just oh, I don't like this series. I'm going to go on to the next one. There's a billion of them to start watching. Yeah. Is I have to feel related to the characters. I have to have some kind of empathy for the characters or sympathy. And I have to feel like I care about what happens to them. Mm -hmm. Is that, is it different in animation or is it basically the same philosophy? It's really the same. It's exactly the same. You know, and I think um, I'm glad to hear those kind of um, reactions because that's what sometimes people forget in animation. Right. You know, like we get we get caught up in a lot of the other fun, flashy, exciting parts. You know, like if you showed me 30 minutes of the most exciting fight choreography, I, I, I'm usually not excited unless I care about why they're fighting. Mm hmm. Well, we love being able to set the stage at Falcons. That's what we do. We're storytellers here. And, and mm. we often reference 
Pixar, and, and I know myself, the best probably 30 minutes of animation that ever kicked off a film was WALL-E with no dialogue. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's just the mm-hmm. great, the mm-hmm. greatest way to tell a story. Absolutely. So um, t- talk about telling stories in, in the future, the near future, as far as we can predict anyway, specifically for themed rides yeah. and attractions. Since now that you're in the, the Kathmandu universe yeah. with us, how do, you, how do you see that working? Well, I mean, the interesting point in time we're at now, I mean, I think in the world of streamers and the world of competitive distributors, it's a crazy time in a way because everyone's trying to make more noise than the other person. And they're paying for it. Mm. So I think what you're going to see in general, you know, and hopefully with, with, with our project is that you'll get premium production quality, premium storytelling and premium marketing. Cause everyone's got to, got to hit a home run. Mm-hmm. And that's where the bar's at. What excites you specifically about Katmandu Group's IP? Well, you know, I think when I first looked at the, the materials and I saw the theme park and, and I saw everything going, I mean, I, I think, the combination of, you know, whimsy, fun, and family friendliness, like those are things that were like all maybe that I want to see and what I want to create. I mean, I spent a lot of time in really adult, adult animation and, you know, I love it. I'm still into it, but it, it's kind of not where my heart is. Maybe I'm just getting older and I'm getting, you know, more into the idea of valuable entertainment for families. Mm-hmm. That really struck a chord with me. And I think there's something about the theme of imagination and the theme of, you know, the power of what you can create with your mind in an imaginary world. Like that was like, aha, that was my aha moment. One thing a lot of kids producers talk about and a lot of kids people, even in the consumer products world, they talk about play patterns, you know, which is like, what can I play out of this? And the fact that there's like theme parks already out there where people are literally you know, quote unquote, playing Kathmandu. Yeah, it's already an experience that people are having kind of offline as yeah. opposed to, you know, in media. Kathmandu is going the other way around. I mean, uh, a lot of times yeah. you have the movie first and then you have the theme park attraction. Right, right. You know, I mean, there's a couple of case studies. I mean, there's obviously Pirates of the Caribbean. Mm-hmm. Right. was a great adaptation of a ride into a feature film franchise. Right. Mm-hmm. Agreed. What is selling right now? What do people want to see? More than ever in my career, authenticity, point of view, and personal experience are are selling right now. Mm -hmm. You know, so bringing to bear the thing that you are uniquely qualified and experienced to create because of your own personal bias and life history and and point of view, that's that's what people want, where we want to feel like we know not just the show, we kind of want to know the voice and the person behind it who's making it. And we want to believe that they're telling us about themselves. Well, Eric, thank you so much for joining us on our podcast. You're welcome. That does it for this episode of Experience Imagination. I'd like to thank our special guests again, Grant and Jessica G. George, as well as Eric Calderon. If you have any questions or comments about today's topic, you can send us an email at podcast at falconscreativegroup.com. One more time now that you're ready podcast at falconscreativegroup.com. We'll see you in the next episode. This has been Experience Imagination. For more information about this episode's discussion, be sure to visit our blog at falconscreativegroup.com. And don't forget to follow Falcons Creative Group on LinkedIn, Facebook, and Instagram.